Hello, everyone. This past weekend, I was speaking with Rosie Hartz, our Faith Formation Director, and she told me that many of her friends and Facebook people uh, liked the videos we put on the website for the weekend and suggested that I do this again. And she was kind enough to show me how to use my, my iPhone to do this. And so far, I'm very amazed that I've actually got this working. Uh, all of you know that I'm basically a Luddite to avoid all things technical, but so far, so good. Um, as you can see, I'm at the residence, my home next door to the church, and off of our living room is a small little library area, and that's where I am right now. Eventually, these reflections are going to turn into a virtual tour of our house, but we'll see. These reflections are much like what I do at uh, weekday masses. Uh, at weekday masses, they run about one minute because so many of our people at the mass are on their way to work. So important to keep things moving along. You, of course, can turn these on and off anytime you want. When I begin a homily, I always begin by reading the scriptures and writing my own notes and thoughts next to those scriptures. Then I will consult scripture scholars and spiritual writers to get their insight, which of course is generally much better than mine. And then I write. So what I'm sharing with you today, some might be my ideas, some might be ideas I got from someplace else, just so you have some sense of where I'm going. Our gospel for this Tuesday is taken from John. It'll be helpful if you read this beforehand, but if you read afterwards, that's okay too. It takes place at this portico of Bethsaida. And I remember last November when I was in Israel, um, Brother Rob Robertson and Father Lentz and I and Father Egan too were at this portico. And it was just ruins now, of course, there's no water. But we were all kind of talking about the stories that took place at the portico of Bethsaida. Three main characters. We have Jesus, we have the afflicted man, and we have the Jews. In John's Gospel, it's almost always referring to the Jews. Many scripture scholars believe that John's Christian community that he developed after Jesus' ascension uh, were, had a difficult time with the Jewish community, especially the Jewish leaders. And there's some bad blood going on there. And thus, in John's Gospel, there's always this shrill, it's the Jews. Uh, historically, regrettably, uh, these passages are often used for anti-Semitism, you know, a reason to be anti-Jewish, anti and that's, of course, wrong. In our story today, uh, Jesus comes to the portico. There's a man there who's afflicted, and he can never get into the pool for healing because he has no one to take him to the pool. We think this man may have been poor because he had no job because of the affliction, and also, you know, he had no, no family or friends to take him to the pool. And Jesus heals him. Jesus, Jesus ignores the power of the pool and just heals the man. Healing took place on a Sabbath. Now, the Jews, these leaders, are questioning the man, who healed you? The man doesn't know. Jesus slipped away. But now, as we move along, we see that the leaders are really angry with Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath. Now, you would think, when someone's healed of a horrible disease, they'd be rejoicing. Wouldn't that be a natural response, joy, rejoicing? But not so. It wasn't keeping the Sabbath holy. I can't imagine a better way to keep the Sabbath holy than healing someone. Now the man uh, comes is again, meets Jesus. And Jesus says to the man, you know, don't, don't tell, don't sin no, sin no more. Sin no more. And then did not take that right? Because he now runs off and tells the Jews what Jesus did. And the Jews will plot against him. And this will bring Jesus to Calvary. On Good Friday, when you're thinking of the crucifixion, keep this story in mind. This is what brings Jesus to Calvary. One of the many things that brings Jesus to Calvary. As we get closer to Holy Week, uh, we see the tension increase. And Jesus' actions divide people into followers and those who will betray him. We think of betrayal, we quickly, quick, quickly think of Judas, of course, but also Peter. And we betray Jesus in many ways. And that's kind of a reflection for us. You know, we're with Jesus the good times. We're a little lukewarm, maybe even chilly in the bad times, you know. We're either with or with that not, you know. At this particular time, we are praying with good reason. Uh, we turn to prayer, hoping this virus ends soon. 
praying for the health and well-being of all of our family and friends and nation, praying for a quick recovery so the economy gets back going. And that's good. God bless us for doing this. Important. But also, I think, when we pray, to begin with, I trust in you, God. All my trust is in you. Sometimes when we pray, we might be telling God what to do. Not so much that, that um, we're asking for God's help. We're really saying, God, do this, God, do that, God, do this. Understandable. It may not the best way to go about it. Perhaps better to begin with, all my trust is in you. We need help. We have a lot of help down here. There's a prayer I say most every day, and maybe it's helpful to you. The prayer goes like this. Oh Lord, may everything I do begin with your inspiration. May I always have your divine assistance. May all my good works for their completion in you. Amen. Know that all of you are in our prayers. God bless you.